thrilled that Ken came here from Michigan, um, uh, tro tropical Michigan. Um, and he's going to tell you the story of one of my, um, one of my favorite stories in all, uh, success stories in all of legal, the story of Cy Farthleen, uh, where he has served as the, as the CEO. Think of a law firm the size of one of our seven sister law firms here in Toronto that figured out change management early, took all those pain, painful kicks in the shins internally to um, get a program out there that ultimately became another business besides the provision of legal services. They are a consultancy around Lean and Lean Six Sigma for their clients. That's the holy grail because if you just want to give legal advice as your primary way to make your living, you're you're on the Titanic. You've got to find other ways to, to drive and create value, and they've done it. It's a phenomenal story. There's nothing like it in Canada, I can tell you that, although that might be subject to change. Oh, if Jason was talking about mashups, I'm a mush-up. Um, I'm, I'm a guy who's been in the, industry, the legal industry in one form or another for about 37 years. Um, I have worked as a paralegal. I've worked as a lawyer uh, in a boutique firm. I've worked as a partner in one of the top AMLA firms. I've had my own firm. I've uh, worked in a mid-sized firm. I've been at a Fortune 500 company in-house. I've been general counsel of three Fortune 1000 corporations. And I've been a consultant at another major firm and now I'm a lean law evangelist. So I've got more echo chambers going on in my head than I can possibly talk about. Uh, that's probably why I'm a bit psychotic. Um, what I'm going to do is talk about Seifarth and then put Seifarth in a, a bigger context. And the Seifarth story here is really a startup story, but it's a startup story viewed through the lens of a large law firm. Okay? So most people want to bash on me. Um, or at least they want to bash on the universe that I'm in right now because big law is, you know, everything. It's the devil incarnate. Um, we, are, we are the ones that everyone would like to destroy. And yet, um, Seifarth is that sort of oddity. It's the story of a large law firm that broke out of the mold, did something different, did something innovative, um, and continues to do those types of things. So I like to think of us as the example that it's not the size of the environment, it's the nature, it's the culture of the environment, it's what you want to do with the environment, and give you a little bit of a story about what innovation and doing a startup can be like in the legal space. Um, and so a couple of things to think about as we go through this. Jason talked about the sales cycle for law. Um, I've actually never seen it really talked about as being a one-year sales cycle. Typically, it's a three-year sales cycle uh, to get clients in. And that's if you're you know, really happy, optimistic, and everything is going well. Because even if you get the client in, uh, certainly in the large law firm environment today, what it can often mean is you're being put on a panel of law firms. And that just means you have the ability to get work from the companies that have put you on the panel. doesn't mean you're actually going to get work. So think about that three years, which is really what probably people more in the large law firms talk about, as a sales cycle. And then think about that sales cycle in terms of trying to do a startup. Okay? Because a startup, obviously, you're trying to get clients in the door quickly. So this is the paradigm that Seifarth has used for 10 years now as part of its Seifarth Lean story. Seifarth started Lean, using Lean in a law firm back in 2005. I started using Lean in the legal environment back in 1994, and right now I'm not aware of anyone who can predate me on using Lean in any significant way uh, in the legal industry, but I'm sure they're out there. Um, what happened for me, and then what happened for Seifarth, and I'll be short on me, is in 1994, I moved from being a partner in a major law firm to a company. The company was two years into a lean transformation. So it was going from being an old manufacturing company to a modern lean thinking company. And we had done that from the top down. And so every department, every aspect of the company needed to become lean. And that included the law department. So the law department, uh, the lawyers started to try and figure out what this whole thing meant. 
Um, and we started in our very simplistic way trying to become more efficient as a law department. Um, and we started trying to apply lean thinking to doing that. So I, I won't go into all the detail, but that's where we started. I became infected when I moved from the law department to the operational side. So I got to run the second largest facility in the organization. And the first thing they did is ship me off to Japan. And I took a couple of trips to Japan for an extended period. And I studied at a place called Shingohutsu Company Limited, which was a consulting firm started by the engineers, some of the engineers, who had worked at Toyota in the uh, early days of Toyota becoming the Toyota production system, TPS. And they had worked for a guy whose name is Taiichi Ono. Taiichi Ono, if you ever hear about Lean, is credited as being sort of the father of Lean, or at least the guy who pulled it together. And he started something called the Toyota Autonomous Study Group. And so the people who were my senseis, my teachers, were in that Toyota Autonomous Study Group, and they developed the pieces of Lean with Taiichi Ono. As they got older, he sent them off to establish this consulting firm, Shingahutsu. And so people like me would go over there. You'd spend some time in the classroom, and then you'd go uh, to Gemba Kaizen, where you'd go out to the shop floor. You'd work on the shop floor in a Japanese manufacturing plant. I helped make air conditioners. And you would work as part of a multidisciplinary team doing uh, Kaizen events. 2005, Seifarth said, you know, the old view of how you do law is probably not going to be the way of the future. Clients are starting to look for more efficiency. They're starting to look for how you deal with this more or less problem you may hear about today. And so we came up, uh, they came up with this idea uh, that you have really a tangled way that you deal with law. Okay? We don't have processes. In fact, when I give my process, uh, presentation. If I don't remember, usually about 15 minutes into it, I will get somebody who will raise their hand and say, I like what you're talking about. Could you just tell me what a process is? Because I don't understand processes. I don't even know what a process is, so I don't really understand how we fix them. Um, this, is, this is the practice of law. It's a hodgepodge. Every lawyer does his or her own thing. If you have an 800-person firm, you have 800 lawyers doing his or her own her own thing. And it gets worse because every time they do it, they do it differently than the time they did it before. Okay? Sometimes they progress, sometimes they regress, sometimes they do it the way they did the last deal or the last case. Sometimes they just read a new case, so they do it differently. It's always an ever-changing universe. Okay? I call it controlled chaos. Um, it is something that is complex, it's complicated, and it's certainly not structured. What is the goal of what we're trying to do. And the goal is simply to bring that clarity of thought that says let's standardize things, let's use templates, let's use guidelines, let's, let's use processes that we have defined. We call them process maps. We put them into that form so that now if you go to the lawyer and ask them to handle a case for you, and then six months later you go to that same lawyer, the hope is that lawyer will handle the same, this new case the same way they did before but for any improvements in the process that have been made in the meantime. We don't want lawyers fumbling around. We don't want them spending time on things they don't need to spend time on. And now you're going to start hearing the tip of the iceberg problem. Think about being in a large law firm, probably almost any law firm nowadays. Your whole revenue model is based on what? Spending more time on the file. Spending more time on the file. Okay? Your whole revenue model is based on being inefficient. The most inefficient person in the firm probably is going to become chairman. <laughs> because why? What, what's going to happen if you're really inefficient? They're billing the hours. They're billing the hours. Okay, they're billing seven gazillion hours a year. Okay, everybody's slapping this guy on the back as he walks down the hallway. He's a hero because he is incredibly inefficient. I mean, he's just not bad. He's over the top bad, OK? And that is great, because revenues are going up every year. Now you're in a large law firm. And imagine going to your partners and saying, what we want to do is become efficient. Okay? Think about that for a moment. Your whole model, for 100 years, the legal system in Certainly the UK, Canada, the US, Australia, New Zealand, everywhere around has been based on this inefficiency model. And now you're saying, we'd like to become efficient. Okay? So 
think in terms of being a startup, trying to change the culture of an organization that everyone has been ingrained in over to this. Okay, this is what the timeline looks like. So go back to that. It takes three years to build a client base. 2005, you get this great idea. We're going to do something differently. Okay? Now, what happens in a startup? How many startups start and, amazingly enough, achieve success on the exact same model they started with? None, right? Okay? So, exact same thing happens in Slyforth. They get this idea that they're going to go out, they're going to be lean, they're going to do Lean Six Sigma, they've talked to clients, they bring in the consultants, they sit down, they do the training, and it is an unmitigated disaster. I mean, it's not just bad. It is really, really bad. Because the first thing that happens is the consultants come in, and it's Lean Six Sigma. So their formulas, and their DMAIC, and their all of this structure, and you know, statistical analysis, and the lawyers are sitting there going, because the lawyers don't know math. Remember, the last time they took math, if they could get away with it, was second grade. <laughs> so they don't know math. So seeing statistical analysis is just you know smoke coming out, and they're melting down, and it's just a horrible experience. And now they're supposed to apply this to the practice of law. You don't understand. The practice of law, it's divine inspiration coupled with art. <laughs> it's one of those moments when you sit down and you feel so in touch with the universe because you are one with everything and you know in that moment that yes, if you do that, you will be in criminal violation of the antitrust laws. <laughs> And that's how it comes to us. And so to think that you could actually structure this and put statistical analysis to it is just, I mean, this is horrible. This is, no, 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 I'm sorry. Plus the fact that you want to destroy our revenue model. I mean, you do understand I'm buying a new Mercedes next week, right? So it doesn't quite work. You have to restructure it. So what happens over the next several years is this reformation of the idea of Lean Six Sigma in the context of a law firm. It gets stripped down. It gets rebuilt. What does it really mean? What can you really do? You don't really have data in the legal environment, certainly not in that time period. So we start rethinking and start rebuilding what this means. And then you start experimenting on yourself. Because you know, if you don't take the drug yourself then, and live through the experience, probably your clients won't live through the experience either. So test it on yourself. Try your conflict system. Try this, try that. It gets. So to a point where it you know, seems to work, they start doing process maps of actual legal things they do. And now we're up to around 2008. Okay, So you see 2007, we have this ongoing process mapping. 2008, 2009, we're getting into different things. See October 2008, first Seifarth Lean client collaboration. Okay, So there's this nutcase in West Michigan, this mush-up guy. He knows Lean. He's general counsel of a company. He's got this massive trademark portfolio. His company operates globally. Uh, products are traded in 200 countries around the world. 4,000 plus trademarks. Today, 6,000 plus trademarks. Then 12. Today, 16 major brands. And there's a part-time uh, paralegal who works part-time on the trademark portfolio. And there's a smattering of lawyer time being spent on it. There's got to be a better way to handle this. So he spends a year trying to figure out what to do. He talks to every firm that says they do trademark work. And they all say, remarkably, the same thing. We do really good trademark work. We're experienced. We know trademark law. We handle it efficiently because we are very good trademark attorneys. We're experienced. We know trademark law. And after about the 700th time you've heard this story, you start to figure out, OK, perhaps there isn't anything new. But you're at a conference in Boston. You sit down at the table, and one of the other participants introduces herself by saying, hi, I'm from Seifarth. We do Seifarth Lean, which is Lean Six Sigma. So you send an email at some ungodly early time in the morning to this person saying, perhaps we should connect up. Maybe your Lean can work with my background in Lean and this trademark portfolio we have, and we could do things differently. We could become actually efficient, standardized. We could reduce costs. We could achieve greater metric uh, results. 
that email hits the inbox of the lawyer in the firm and then immediately gets redistributed to the executive committee and, and anybody else you can find who's awake at 6 in the morning saying, thank God we got one on the hook. Well, not exactly, but she has a client. And that's when Wolverine Worldwide started working with Cypharth. And we built, um, transferred our portfolio over, and we built a metric system based on business metrics, performance improvement. And as a reward for taking on our portfolio, we reduced what we were going to pay them from what we had been paying before. We took it down 85%. And so we said, you get the portfolio, but you only get 85% of what we were paying before, and the portfolio will be bigger. And then in year two, we took it down to 85% of year one. And in year three, we took it down to 85% of year two. Do the math. Sorry for the lawyers in the room. Somebody can do it for you. And it will come out to about 60% of what was being paid before the transformation. And now the portfolio is bigger. And the law firm is getting paid based on business metrics. What is the time to get a trademark approved? What is the success rate on the uh, application for the trademark? So it's all based on what our business returns. What is the return on investment? What is the net present value? We present the uh, results to the CFO and the CEO all based in business speak, not based on you know, how many lawyers per widgets in whatever. So as we go forward from there, the startup is now gaining traction. Okay? So what's happening is in the firm, this idea of doing things lean has become a movement of clients saying, well, can you help me by providing project management services? Can you help me by providing technology development? Can you help me by providing process improvement? So 2008, another thing happens, and that's a subsidiary <laughs> is changed into what's called Cypharth Lean Consulting. The job of the subsidiary, and I want you to think about law practices in three buckets right now. So right here is the traditional, we provide legal services. Right here is a mashup of legal services plus consulting work. So we want you to handle our portfolio, but we'd like you to project management, put it on metrics, and do some things uh, in addition to just doing the legal work. And right here is, we have 1,000 law firms. That's probably too many. We probably need 200 law firms. Can you manage, can you put together metrics and an evaluation system for a convergence project? Or we get contracts spewing out of every place imaginable. They come into the law department. We got a mess. We need to triage these. We need to focus. These go here. These go here. These go here. Can you build a triage system for us? So it's a consulting project. Those are the three buckets. Cypher Lean Consulting certainly does that third bucket. It assists on the middle bucket, which is a hybrid of work, and it doesn't touch the legal work. Okay? But because it, it resides in a law firm, you can integrate that center space. You can integrate the consulting with the law. So that's when it's created. And as we go forward here, what you see is a development where demand from the client Novelty in the market, being first to, to market with the idea, starts growing it. So if I walk forward today, what you would find is today we have roughly 30 people who are now in Cypharth Lean Consulting. About a third of those people have law degrees and technology backgrounds. So they may have a degree in technology, or they may just have training and experience in technology. None of those people practice law. They are always client-facing, technology development specialists. So they go in, they've been to law school, they understand what it is when you talk about a contract or a merger or a lawsuit. But what they're doing is listening to the client and translating, I have a problem. I have all these contracts. I have a portfolio of litigation, and I need to manage it. They're taking that, and they're filtering it through. We have a variety of tools that we can put together, we can customize, and we can deliver a solution to you that helps you solve that tangled mess that you saw up there and make it more efficient. So for example, Nike has contracts coming in of an IT nature. Before we started working with them, it took them over two weeks. They don't know how long, but it took them over two weeks to triage, get it down, get it turned around. We put the process together. Think of it as one of those pachinko machines. Comes down, bounces, pops out over here. Single lawyer does it. Pops out over here. In-house does it. Pops out over here. Law department does it. Pops out over here. 
major law firm does it because it's a complicated or it has something unique to it. So over two weeks, now they're down to about a day. Right? From a business perspective, think about that. You're taking a contract and you're turning it and it's done. Velocity within businesses has a lot of uh, value and so that's where a consulting type project will come out of it. So those are what the that's what the technologists do. They take that, they weave together programs. We don't create programs, but we take programs. Neota Logic, Contract Express. We're going to weave those together. We use a SharePoint backbone. They all go through a portal that we've set up. I'll show you some pictures of it. But that's what's going on in the legal tech side of it. The other 20 people in there are consultants slash project managers, client facing. They also are in the room when you meet with a client or a prospective client. Their job is to take the mass process map it to project management, to figure out a way so that it is on a standardized backbone so that as you go through this process, whether it's litigation, a portfolio, whatever it might be, a merger and acquisition, there's somebody who's paying attention to how this happens and making sure the pieces fit together so you don't end up on the day before closing with somebody said, did we get financing? I just, I can't remember. Okay? You don't want that to happen. And today, that's actually a really big risk that companies are facing because some, some transactions, especially ones that larger firms get involved in, have become so complicated with so many moving pieces that it's no longer the world it used to be almost 40 years ago when I started. Today, lawyers sitting there trying to manage all this stuff and trying to be the deal attorney and trying to negotiate and trying to keep the CFO happy and, and, and are actually out of their depth in doing this. So you need somebody who's honchoing this thing every day along. Where I came from, CFOs are very concerned and CEOs are very concerned. Give you an example, Seifarth Lean Consulting assisted on the largest IPO that happened in Thailand. Okay? It had failed twice before, not because of anything other than it wasn't project managed. They weren't getting it done in time for the launch. So the third time around, we did the project management. Other firms actually did the legal work and it was a successful IPO. And that's lots of times just that's the dynamic that you're fighting. So today, 30, 30 people sitting in that Seifarth Lean Consulting subsidiary. It's done work for 14 out of the 20 largest custom, uh, clients of the firm. It's building technology solutions. Today, there are over 500 process maps in existence that are base processes that the, the firm does. And these are people who are sitting in the room when we have these client meetings. One of the most exciting things to happen is you go to a client meeting with an attorney. And the attorneys at Seifarth, you know, they're, they're typical. You have some who are on board. You have some who are not on board but are going to probably retire in five years so they don't care. And you have a lot in the middle who are trying to figure out what to do. And you can go to a prospective client meeting with some of these folks, and they have an LSA, Legal Solutions Architect, and they have a project manager sitting there, and then they have the lawyer. And the lawyer carefully coaches them beforehand. Now I'm going to be talking about, you know, it's all been great. I've handled a million of these. I'm brilliant. I've had divine inspiration at least 20 times in the past week. So I can do the legal work. You guys are there just in case a question comes up. And you get in the room and the client says, hi, nice to meet you. Great. So, and they turn to the legal solution architect and the project manager and the next 59 minutes are all about them. Why is that? Why are they talking to those people and not talking to the divine inspired lawyer with sort of a glow going on here? Because they, they're listening to them and they're actually trying to resolve the problem that they have, not the lawyer imposing. Problem. The problem they have. Okay? If you exist in a corporate world, I can guarantee you one thing. Nobody wakes up in the morning in a corporation and says, I have just got a really cool legal problem. I mean, I am so excited about this legal problem I get to deal with. Okay? Does not happen. I'm crushing dreams of a lot of people, I know, but it does not happen. They have problems. They have problems that need solutions. Sometimes legal skills are helpful in solving those problems. Lots of times it's a lot of other skills that are helpful in solving those problems. When I was a general counsel, I would have people who would come to my office and I'd be all prepped for my, okay, this is going to be some absurd legal question that I have to answer and I have no training in that area, this will be fun. And they'd walk in and I had no idea why they had called me for this meeting because it's not somebody I usually dealt with. And they'd walk in the door and the question would go like this. 
we're having a problem and Department Z is just, they're not on board and they're having the, a problem. We need somebody to work with us so that we and Z work well together and we understand that you guys are pretty good at making that happen. Can you help us? And I'm seeing they're madly going through tort, no, no. Contract, no, no. <laughs> Property, maybe, intellectual prop could, they didn't care that I was a lawyer. What they cared is, I know the company, I know how it works, and I'm helpful at saying, okay, let's break this down, let's find a way to see how it works together and make it work. And that's what the in-house counsel were saying. We know you can solve your legal problems. What we want is somebody who can help us solve the problem that we have. So that's what Seifarth Lean Consulting is about. It's about helping them solve the problem which sometimes has a le legal component. Okay, so now I'm gonna do a quick walk through the industry and where it fits in and then show you the tech. Okay, so three on Suskind. Who's got the, somebody drinking here? Who's, <laughs> um, and if not, why not? Um, so this is Suskind again. Here's the, the uh, Suskind market evolution along the bottom. People clients, organizational clients on the left. This is a model that Bill Henderson, who's a professor at Indiana University, put together uh, and lets me steal from him to use so I look right. Uh, yeah, he turned this into that, that. This he came up with. He actually presented it at a um, little party he had in New York that was 100 people. Uh, that uh, I've forgotten the name of it now, but it was another one of these conclaves of echo chamber folks like this. And he tested it, and we didn't rip it to shreds. Um, shame on us. And so he's been rolling this out, and that paper was his actual introduction of it to the world. So you'll see it there. This is what we start with. The Artisan Guild, Big Law Regional Solo, and Criminal Defense. So these are small clients all the way up to the organizations, which traditionally, the larger the organization, big law will handle it, at least on strategic or large matters, okay? That's the sweet spot of the universe. If you're really down in commoditized work over there, you start talking about really simple matters, but they're also really low margin matters, okay? So yes, you could do that, but it's like high volume, really low. The one that typically gets described there are collection matters. Okay, if you're a distributor, you have a lot of retail clients or something that your business operates, some are always going bust and your credit department is always trying to recover their money. Um, it's a very high volume, low margin type of work. Large law firms, and a lot of these firms don't deal with it. There's really specialized people. But the productized, systematized work tends to be that work that has a nice volume to it, it's repetitive in nature, and it's similar enough that you can put it into systems and really deal with it well. As you get up here, standardized and bespoke, they all have components that fall into that category. I mean, due diligence might fit there. Um, if you do discovery in a lawsuit, e-discovery might fit up there. The strategy for the lawsuit could be bespoke, but actually looking through two gazillion documents is something we can train a computer to do, so it's a more routine type of activity. But that's the sweet spot, okay? So what's happened? Well, all these firms have started trying to figure out how to handle that in different ways. They did it in the past, but today, especially in uh, larger corporations, that systemized and productized work is often done in-house. It's just cheaper, okay? It costs one-third to one-fourth for our attorney in-house versus using somebody outside, so they do that work in-house. But now you see two other columns, multidisciplinary teams and low-cost providers. So this is what's going on in the market. And by the way, the day he drew this, it was out of date, okay? I'm sure many of you out in the audience could say, okay, here's where this doesn't fit, but think of this as sort of a general conception point, recognizing that this is really a moving target. So on the low end, People Law, Modria and Legal Force. Modria is an online mediation service, but it gets used by the U.S. government, so it's not something to sneeze at in terms of size. Legal Force is the name for Trademarkia. Trademarkia is an online service where you can go on and apply for a trademark. It is the largest trademark application place in the United States. It has a back end. You'll see it's in multidisciplinary teams. These have back ends where lawyers can become involved if needed. So if you have a thorny problem with your trademark, it will go to an outside lawyer 
because these are not law firms. These are service providers, but they've affiliated with law firms and lawyers to help solve problems. Okay? Legal publishers, LegalZoom, I uh, probably have heard about LegalZoom, roughly the same as Axiom now, 200 to 300 million. Um, LegalZoom has gone into the UK, by the way. In the UK, you have something called an ABS, Alternative Business Structure. I know it's really popular here in Canada with the regulatory agencies. <laughs> um, I just testified before the ABA, and they loved seeing my shining, smiley face telling them how they were screwing up the process. Um, but that ABS structure, LegalZoom went to the UK about a month ago, maybe a little more, they got approved as an ABS. So in the UK, they now operate as a law firm. In the US, they operate as a publisher, but again, you can go online, you can buy a will, you can buy a uh, durable power of attorney. The trick is these two boxes are moving upstream. Okay? They started with people, but then they moved into the small and medium enterprise market. So now smaller, medium-sized businesses, and in a few cases, even large businesses, are dipping into this, I can go online and for a fixed cost, get something very quickly. Okay? E-discovery vendors, okay, I don't need to deliver or dwell on that one. They've been around for a while. Um, very competitive market, uh, but it's one where we discovered early on you could use computers to do things much more efficiently. You know, you now have predictive coding versus the old days when I started almost 40 years ago. Predictive coding was a paralegal thing, and they're going, uh, yeah, that's relevant. Uh, no, that's not relevant. Um, was really great work. Okay, so. Multidisciplinary teams here. In-house vertical integration. If you went to the UK, you'd hear about a company called Carillon. Carillon is not in the legal space. They are a six billion US uh, size company. They have nothing to do with the practice of law. They're not, that's not their thing. But their law department set up a subsidiary called CAS, Carillon Advisory Services. Paralegals plus managers. That subsidiary provides services to Carillon's legal department because they've set it up in a very lean project management focused way, so it's very efficient. And it now provides contract services to large law firms in the UK because they are so good at what they do and they can understand and deal with certain types of documents very well. They are a service provider to large law firms in the UK. So vertical integration by a non-legal company much less a legal company. In-house, you're seeing hiring at the largest corporations because they're doing labor arbitrage right now. They're bringing work in from outside law firms in-house. And remember that one-third to one-fourth ratio of cost. So just by hiring people in-house, they're reducing their costs. Labor arbitrage is a very temporary solution. If you're doing labor arbitrage, you're basically trying to become the Betamax or the DVD guy. You're going to exist for a while, and then you're going to disappear. So the people that are hiring in-house are going to have a problem X years down the road because the CFO is going to say, I want you to get rid of those bodies. And that's where the people in the room can come into play because those bodies are going to be replaced by technology. So right now, it's a shift. A GC can very quickly cut his or her costs, but it is a very temporary solution. New law, Axiom, we've already heard about. Uh, and then there's this firm called Seifarth that's doing lean law that's stuck in there. So vertical integration. We have lawyers. We have project managers. We have LSAs. Okay? So we have people, consultants. We have people in different roles doing work. And then tech law. Um, this is where you're getting into the more hardcore technology applied to law universe. So uh, Lex Machina is one I like to talk about because it's, a, it's an interesting solution. Uh, developed out of Stanford, it deals with patents. So patents are very, very expensive to litigate, especially if they're in the areas like uh, tech or um, pharma. Very costly to do. So what Lex Machina did is assemble a database of structured information about patent lawsuits. And they just scoured all the decisions and every other piece of information they could get, and they packed it into their database in a structured way, and then they've applied analytics to it. So now you're a general counsel. You're thinking about bringing a big patent suit, or you've been sued with a big patent suit. You can go to Lex Machina, pay them a fee. It'll crunch through their system, and they can start providing you predictive analytics on the cost and probable outcomes of the lawsuit. All right? 
If I'm going to lose, and that shows a 95% chance that I'm going to lose, but I can pay $10 million for the privilege of losing, then I might want to settle the case for $2 million. That's opposed to the very scientific and comprehensive method that's used today, where you go to a large law firm partner who goes, oh, let me see. No, oh, I'd say it's probably 50-50. Um, which is really helpful when you're a general counsel, by the way. I mean, you just, it, you can't imagine the glow you get when you pay somebody a lot of money to say, it's 50-50. Because <laughs> okay? that helps. You know, you wouldn't have gotten there on your own. I know that. <laughs> so, this is from a guy who used to do trademark. I, I, I was a litigator early in my career. And then when I had that trademark portfolio, we would always ask, what are the odds that we will win an opposition in Guatemala? And the attorneys in pick your country would always come back and say it was 50-50. Um, so we really cheered when we got a 60-40. That was somebody was willing to throw it out there and just lay everything on the line. OK, and then systems law, uh, legal on-ramp. Legal on-ramp is sort of a, a hybrid entity. Uh, it's a social media chat room for lawyers who are, are frustrated about the universe. But it's also a tech play. Uh, legal on-ramp working with a, a new law firm in the UK called Riverview Law uh, put together a solution for banks. Um, it is a hybrid of technology and people. Right now, that's, that tends to be the most common situation. Large banks in the UK are faced with compliance problems. They have to show through a, you know, two billion documents that if the next stress comes along, they won't go bankrupt. So they're having to assemble all these documents, organize them, and then be able to produce them to regulators. Legal OnRamp is providing that type of solution. Axiom Law just signed the deal in the US to do a similar type of thing. Um, remember, financial institutions, pharmaceutical companies have lots of money, and they spend a lot of money on outside law firms. During the financial crisis, some of the big financial institutions were spending over a billion dollars a year on legal services. So it's a big pot of money, and if you can figure out how to do it more efficiently and cost-effectively, it's a very receptive audience. These are hybrid solutions. They're using people to do coding, but they're capturing the coded information in databases. So they're trying to walk this line of we don't have technology yet that can scan a document the way a person can and tell us everything. OK, trying to move quickly. So what does technology look like if you're a large law firm implementing technology? We're not Clio. We're not a tech play, per se. Um, we have a lot of things on our plate. So we're trying to, to navigate this world. The technology I'm showing you, developed by people in the firm, these are the LSAs. Uh, the LSA process started only about uh, three years ago. Okay? So this is not something that dates back a long time. This is these lawyers, technologists, working with clients, so it's client-driven, trying to come up with solutions that address what they need. So in many respects, you're not going to see a user interface that's going to be the same as you would see from a technology company or on your smartphone. Because we're walking this balance of trying to develop something that is actually usable, but at the same time is affordable in a particular case for a particular client with a particular problem. So remember, we are not primarily a tech company. We are knitting together tech others put together. So you have different things. We use Cypherth Link. That is our portal. It's a SharePoint portal uh, activity. And all of our solutions flow through that. But you'll see anywhere from dashboards. Um, this is obviously sort of an opening screenshot landing page that you're going to go into. Uh, you see a lot of things where we're trying to capture data and now start providing it in a way that the companies haven't done before. So imagine you're in a company. You get lots of calls because your HR folks are always asking you questions. They always need to know what's the current rule in Alabama for military leave, or what is the current rule in Utah for X or Y. So a law department or some person is capturing those calls, finding the answer, and responding. But nobody's capturing the data. Nobody knows how many calls. Nobody knows what the calls are on. Nobody knows what the resolution is. Nobody knows what jurisdictions they relate to. It's just a hodgepodge of things happening. So what you start trying to do is capture that in some structured way. And you don't, you know, these are phone calls. These aren't computer-driven capture the data. So you've got to have 
very crude, I'd say, ways of capturing the data, putting it into databases, and start trying to drive things off of it. You can start going through and using things like Neota Logic and other programming to say, can we develop, instead of I call you and I ask the question, I go online and I start filling in information into fields. And I have a logic program that says if I answer yes, go here, no, go here, and if I don't know, drop into this bucket. And as you go through and start answering the questions through the solver, it's saying, okay, I, you're over here, you're over here, and can start moving you, if not to a solution, it can move you into a bucket that says, I've captured a lot of this information. The attorney who's going to have to answer the question can pull up that information, right? I can put some of that information into the form that you'll need because it's a template, I can populate it, and now I'm down to, instead of an hour and a half on the phone with a paralegal or an attorney, it's a 15 minute call focused on exactly what needs to be addressed and then we're done. So it's an efficiency play. We just took an hour and a half down to 15 minutes and I've got a database that I'm building and I can start doing things when I'm capturing data. And this is one of the big problems in the practice of law. In fact, IBM has found this is the biggest problem in trying to apply Watson to the practice of law because they come in and they meet with you, probably met with you, they met with us, and they say, okay, so where's the data? And we go, right. <laughs> divine inspiration, okay? That's <laughs> divine inspiration, folks. I, I just, I lay my hands on Westlaw, it's, it's one of those pure moments. Um, but it is a problem because we don't have structured data in clean form in data sets sitting out in the legal universe. And so IBM has been working to try and figure out the solution to that because that is a big issue. If you think about a law firm, we don't have, even if we capture documents through data management systems, we don't know which was the first or the final version. We don't know that this was a big M&A deal or a small M&A deal. And so there's a lot of information that's missing even if you have them. And even then you don't know that I have the final version. And so there's a lot of issues in that data set. If you're in a company, maybe you do have a DMS, maybe you don't have a DMS. And maybe you have some of this, maybe some of it you don't. If you want to get data about cases, go talk to Lexis and go talk to Westlaw, who, by the way, would like to keep that data to themselves because they want to develop ways to deal with the data. So you don't have access to all of the case law cost-free that you can use as part of this. You don't have access to all the data that's in courts because you have the PACER system. Um, I don't know if it's in Canada, but in the US we have the PACER system. You can log on to PACER and get things, but again, it's unstructured data, so you're not going to get much further than you were before. So we have a data issue. And we don't have data captures for things that aren't in those documents. So this is a way to start saying, how can you capture data? How can you start building those databases? And how can you use them to create analytics? Okay. Um, this is something we came up with back when I was at Wolverine, recognizing that we're trying to figure out ways to make things efficient in the universe. So it's obviously an iPad. It's got an app on it. When I used to get um, uh, potential filings for trademarks, we would own a trademark, and in country X, somebody would file a new trademark application. The way this works today is a lawyer will go through the filings in Country X watching for filings that may conflict with your trademark. They flag the ones that are, and then they send you something saying, here's the trademark that was filed for, here's yours, do you want to oppose or not? And by the way, you got five days to make a decision. Okay, so we had developed to the point where we were actually able to say, okay, through an email system, we were capturing um, what trademark they had filed for, but it was an attachment. What trademark we had, but it was an attachment. We would get some information about the classes, about the potential cost, but it was a very clunky system because I'm sitting there with a Blackberry or a smartphone. I've got to flip back and forth. I've got to open attachments. I've got to do all this stuff, and then I've got to sit there and type an answer to it. So this one, uh, this app gives me both the mark that was applied for and our mark in one screen. It gives me the other information. What is the cost? What is the expected outcome? What is the class? Any relevant information is in there. And then down at the bottom, you can see I can 
just click on oppose, don't oppose, or discuss, and if I want, I can put in comments, and it's a platform independent device. So I could use it on my Blackberry, smart phone, iPad, wherever. And when you're getting in dozens of these to deal with, and you're in-house counsel and you got other stuff going on, being able to sit there and say, this is something we were talking about beforehand. I can be at my kid's game, I can be anywhere and just go yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. Okay, so an application that we developed through all this information we have, but now we're also capturing data. So a year from now, somebody else files an app, or somebody files an application, I can say, did we come up against this guy before? And what was the, what did we do? And where to go? So now we have that data set that we're building in the background, whereas before on emails, it was just stuff that went off into the ether. You can start doing simple analytics off of it. So you can start providing things to people that say, this is the average transaction cost, amount by supplier, whatever it might be. So you're starting to give them a dashboard with information. I think that's, that's the key thing to keep in mind, is that when you saw uh, Jason put up that diffusion curve before, and said, you know, we're wait, we're, innovation is down here, and then lawyers are somewhere over here. Okay, we're we're starting to see the momentum build. Um, I don't know the numbers. You may know, Josh, the numbers, but in the U.S. in 2013, um, capital infusions into the legal space for um, uh, startups and innovation were around 60 plus million. 2014, it was 460 million, if I recall correctly. I have not seen, I'm sorry, 2012, 2013. I haven't seen 2014's numbers. I think they were down a bit um, from 2013. But, you know, there's clearly money that's looking at the space, and it starts depending on how you view things. Uh, there were some really big capital infusions in 2014. Uh, to a couple of players that, you know, on the order of, I think one got $30 million for uh, one of the companies. Million, yeah. On the yeah. yeah, so you're starting to see more interest. Part of the problems with the legal industry and investing money is nobody who's, who's like sane would ever invest in a large law firm or even a medium law firm. Your assets walk out the door every day, you have no cohesion, it's not an institution, you, on and on and on. But as people focus on the technology, the technology is where there are opportunities to not only um, build a business that isn't structured the way a law firm is, but see more business pulled away from the law firms. The other thing that's happening is as the regulatory environment shifts, okay, um, LegalZoom has had, had a number of legal challenges in the US and survived them, and so as that happens, People are testing the waters for the American Bar Association's tolerance and state law bar association tolerance for new models. And as that happens, they're getting bolder and saying, okay, it looks like this will work. So that's why you're starting to see more activity. It's not, you know, a lot of this will sound crazy, and it is. It's simply there is a an set of institutions and people who are very vested from a personal standpoint in maintaining the status quo. And so Unfortunately, the way bar associations tend to work in the U.S., that is a very, very powerful group to overcome. Um, we're, you know, you're fighting the same type of battle in Canada. Um, and in fact, Mitch Kowalski and I had coordinated on what my testimony was because we both had the same viewpoint on it. This is just some of the other things that we're doing. Um, platform independence, you know, when we started all this stuff, it was, easier a few years ago because you simply made it work on a PC and life was good. Everything has to be a responsive design nowadays because you've got to be able to go from laptop to tablet to, to uh, phone. So for those of you thinking of doing things, this gets more onto the techie side but shows what we're having to deal with and that is you have to be cognizant of the universe in which you're living. Smartphones aren't just for people who want to go into a store or be on Twitter or do whatever else. Lawyers want the ability to be able to pull up information, access it, and use it wherever they are, just like other people do. And that's making the tech universe a little bit more interesting for people because you've, you've got to be a little bit more flexible. So that's my spiel about what's going on. Thank you very much.